Welcome, everyone. Um, please give me a thumbs up to just to make sure that you uh, can hear me okay, or a wave, that would be great. I have muted uh, everyone when I set up this meeting on entry. Uh, it looks like mute is working, but I want to make sure that our sound is working. So just give me a wave or a thumbs up, that would be fantastic. Perfect. I think we will just go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to say welcome to everyone once again. Uh, my name is Renee Westmacott, and I am your co-host for the evening. Um, please know that I'm always standing by for any questions that may come up. Um, we can always interrupt and put a hands up and chat with Ellen at the moment, or we can save them for um, a little bit later. There's a chat box that I leave open that you can always enter your questions if you would like. Um, a little bit about Ellen. Uh, Ellen has been with Active Sports Therapy for many years, starting out as a kinesiology student, uh, working part time, then coming back to work as a physio at Active Sports Therapy with a specialty in pelvic floor. Uh, I, I won't take any more of your time. I would like uh, to, I'd like everyone to join me in welcoming Ellen, El <laughs> I'm stumbling on my words today, Ellen Wedemer. <laughs> our pelvic floor physiotherapist at Active Sports Therapy. Welcome, Ellen. Lovely. Thank you, Renee. Um, welcome to everyone that is live now and whoever is watching these videos in the future. Um, as Renee mentioned, I am a pelvic floor physio. I'm also your normal kind of orthopedic everyday physio. And so this kind of presentation takes into account kind of both worlds to make sure that when we are returning to activity postnatally, we're doing it in an appropriate fashion. So for those that don't know, really, really quick, pelvic floor or pelvic health physio, basically the same thing, um, just different words. We look at the pelvis as our specialty, but really the, the body as a whole. So we look at the muscles at the bottom of the pelvis. We can assess for strength, endurance, control. Um, if there's tension in there, those can all cause issues such as incontinence or prolapse or even pain throughout the area. For that reason, we also look at pain in the pelvic region, whether that is uh, sensitization, it could be pain with insertion, just pain in general in that area at all. We also look at surrounding muscles. So you're not just a vulva or a vagina, you are everything, you have your hips, your back, your knees, your ankles, everything like that. And we look at movement patterns, bowel and bladder habits. We're basically, we focus on the pelvis so that we can kind of help you as a whole. So just if I'm talking about pelvic floor physios, that's kind of what we do. Now, if we are gonna talk about returning to sport after baby, we have to start by talking about what happens to your body when you're carrying baby or when you're going through the changes in pregnancy, because we are gonna be looking at those changes to help you kind of rehab and get ready to return to activity later. So there are many, 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 the lists are endless, but these are the ones that kind of matter the most in this situation. The first one is weight gain. You gain weight in pregnancy. You should likely be gaining weight in pregnancy. And that may be in fat stores, but it's also in amniotic fluid, breast tissue. There's so much blood. We'll talk about that in a moment. You get so much more blood. And so that weight gain, which is normal, does put a little bit more load or different load on the joints, the tendons, the ligaments all throughout the body, not just pelvic floor, you're looking at ankles, knees, hips. And with that, we also have changing posture or alignment. So posture alignment, very similar, not necessarily the same thing, kind of depends on who you talk to. But based on your positioning, we have muscles that get used to being in either a shortened position or a lengthened position. And your normal posture is likely going to change once you are going through pregnancy. And with that, this lovely mom that I got off the internet is showing us really typical alignment changes that we see within pregnancy. So we tend to see rib flare, which is basically the front of your rib cage kind of coming outwards a little bit in order to fit baby. Baby needs to grow and move. And so something's got to give, and usually it's our rib cage. The rib cage also expands a little bit. 
And you'll also see that instead of being kind of up and down, so we have that rib flare, so the rib cage is now going on an angle, but it also tends to shift backwards a little bit. We call that a posterior translation. All incredibly normal, especially if you have a bigger baby, totally fine. But it's good that we know that those are changes that are made so that we can kind of look at them later. The other thing is the pelvis. And so I'm gonna get into more kind of rib and pelvis and why that matters later, but you can see most people think that we stick our tail out because we tend to have a bigger arch in our back, but that's usually from the rib cage moving. And what tends to happen is actually the tail will tuck under, especially when we're getting a little bit bigger, when we're in that last trimester, to counter the load that's on the front, we tend to tuck our tail under. So important to know that that's a very common change that the body makes in order to accommodate baby, but we need to think about it later on. With that, we also have biomechanical changes. The hips are getting a little bit wider. Maybe we're not using our muscles the same way. We definitely don't use our abs the same way because baby is now where the abs are. So we tend to get a little bit of separation, which again is normal but now we can't use the abs, so we start to move a little bit differently. The big thing is, especially when you're in your later stages, you kind of get that waddle where you're just trying to carry your weight as much as you can going back and forth. That is something that your body adapts to. And so we need to know that that's the last thing that your body was doing before you had baby. So if we want to return to activity afterwards, that's something we want to keep in mind. Ligament laxity is something I definitely wanted to talk about because Every mom or anyone who is even considered being a mom or has been onto mom Instagram has likely heard about relaxin, which is a hormone that helps relax the ligaments so that we can kind of increase the room in our pelvis for baby to come out in a vaginal birth. Now, it's important to note, I know that this is not a pregnancy activity lecture, but it, this is just spread the word. Yes. Relaxin increases as pregnancy goes on. Usually it spikes very, very, very late in pregnancy. And that means that at absolutely no time in pregnancy are you unstable. The ligaments are made to still hold you together even if that relaxin is flowing. And so we, we are created to be able to run away from a lion at eight and a half months pregnant. You never have to worry about activity or movements creating instability in that pelvis, but it does mean that it is there. We do have a little bit of ligament laxity, so that can affect us during our activities or after, just not as intensely as what we think. There's no need to be worried about activity, either pre or postnatal. The other thing, and you can see I found this image and I think it's wonderful. So we look at our lungs, lungs tend to be tall and skinny. And as soon as babies kind of getting in the way over here, now the lungs have become shorter and wider. And that means that sometimes later in pregnancy, you can actually get an increased breath rate because the lungs aren't expanding the same way. So if you're thinking about, again, the last few months where the lungs are used to being in that position and then six weeks after baby, you're trying to go for walks and you're like, something is weird. The lungs are still adapting as well. Same with blood vessels. We end up having 150%. That is, if you take your normal blood volume, split it in half, and then add that to your normal blood volume, that is the amount of, the amount of blood that we end up with during pregnancy. And that is crazy. So that means your heart is trying to work harder to pump all that blood, that's cardiac output. And we also see the blood vessels actually get floppy. And that's so that you can actually push the blood through there without getting really, really high blood pressure or hypertension. And so the blood vessels, if they're changing over time in pregnancy, they also need a chance to change postnatal to get things back to where they're used to being. I won't get into hormone changes because you could do a five hour lecture on that easily, but we know estrogen, progesterone for sure, you're gonna have fluctuations. Um, they're gonna be significantly different than when we're not pregnant. You also have hormones that only come during pregnancy. You have big ratio shifts of other hormones, potentially testosterone. And so there's just so much going on. And so if we have lots of hormone change in pregnancy, again, things have to kind of settle down postnatally and they need time for that.
I already kind of mentioned, this is not a lecture on exercise during pregnancy, but I have to say exercise is appropriate for almost everyone during pregnancy and it can actually really help you. Um, other than the people who have been told by their OBs and their midwives not to exercise, because there are a few occasions, if you haven't been told that, if you haven't been told to go on bed rest, exercise is awesome. It can help with prepping you for labor and delivery. It can help with your placenta getting nice and strong and healthy. And placenta is very important. That's what babies attach to. That's your kind of communication between mom and baby. And so exercise during pregnancy is wonderful. And if you're able to exercise during pregnancy, if you're able is the big one, then sometimes that can help you with the transition into postnatal activity as well. Now, if anyone who is currently pregnant is watching this at any point, we need to know that activity should be within your comfort levels. Activity includes walking. It's, it, you don't have to be running marathons at seven months pregnant, but just a little bit of movement is always great. But we also have to be able to control our intra-abdominal pressure system. I'm gonna get into that a little bit later in the presentation. You'll hear it a lot, honing and doming. I have a picture later on, but basically it's where if we have separation between our abs, which you will, and all of a sudden you're getting kind of pooching coming out of that separation, that means that you're not using your core appropriately and you're putting too much pressure through the front of the abdominal wall and likely through your pelvic floor as well. So we don't want any pressure in those areas, but if that's not happening, go nuts. Activity is wonderful. Now, the body changed a lot in pregnancy and then it changes again in birth. So if you are having a vaginal birth, first, the pelvis has to open up at the top to allow baby to descend into the pelvis. So we're here. And then that closes the bottom. So we have to switch that. And so once baby's in the pelvis, we have to open up the bottom of the pelvis. That is an intense amount of movement on our pelvis that is not used to being a teeter-totter this way. And so we do see just that change and the body has to be able to adapt to that. The pelvic floor muscles are gonna get pushed on. They actually suspect right now, because there's a lot of research still going on about birth and it's hard to research because you don't wanna risk any babies or moms, of course, but there is a very supported theory that baby's head hitting the pelvic floor is actually what triggers active labor. So baby kind of slowly comes down, comes down. And then once it pushes on those muscles, it can tell body to start pushing or start really like softening the cervix, whatever it needs to do. So the pelvic floor muscles not only get tapped on, but they get pushed through. So they're going to be affected by things. The skin around the vaginal opening which is where we tend to get a little bit of tearing if there is any tearing, um, has to be stretched an intense amount, way more than it's used to. But also the vaginal wall, the internal tissues also get stretched that much. It is not common for you to be pushing something out that's seven pounds or eight pounds or even six pounds, that's huge. And so all of your tissue has to adjust to that and it might change due to it. Not for the long term usually, but there can be changes. And then also the ligaments. For people who do know anything about the pelvic floor, we tend to think more about the muscles, but we have ligaments, which are structures that are basically attaching bone to bone um, or bone to other ligament. And those are what's kind of keeping us all together down there. And so they, those ligaments are getting so much pressure from baby that they're gonna need time to recover and adapt. Now, if you have a cesarean birth, you might have labored Firstly, so there's a chance that you have gotten a lot of the pressure and whatever from the above kind of situation, but then you're also going to have an incision that not only goes through the abdomen, but the uterus itself. So lots and lots of changes, not only in pregnancy, but also birth. And we have to keep those in mind when we're trying to return to any kind of activity. So when I was putting this together, I was trying to kind of look at what do we have to think about when we're returning to activity that maybe you didn't really think of? And then we'll go into kind of how, how the assessments would go, what are we looking for when we're actually returning? So these are the kind of the main umbrellas and we'll dive right into them. So number one, did you have a vaginal versus a cesarean birth? And both of those are going to come with changes 
during the birth, like I talked about, and also considerations postnatally. So with the vaginal birth, we do, we have that pressure and pushing through the pelvic floor. So those muscles were impacted. You might've also had either a tear or an episiotomy, which is an intentional cut to help baby come out, which means you might have stitches, which also means you might not wanna sit, right? Or maybe they are aggravating when you're moving. So there's things to think about in that sense. You also wanna look at the positions during labor and delivery. For example, and there's no judgment, you have to push the way that your body wants to push. But if we push on our backs, the tailbone doesn't actually get to move. And if you think of how our pelvis works, actually, I have my little pelvis here. So this is, this is us, cubic bone is up here, uh, vagina rectum. So we have our little tailbone that comes right here. And if baby is trying to push through, we need that bone to be able to come out and not be tucked under. So if we're normally here, we need it to be able to move out of the way so that baby can come through. But if we lie on our back, sometimes it gets stuck. So maybe we have a tailbone bruise or a tailbone injury that could have been related to the birth. Maybe you gave birth on all fours and it ended up being a very quick, fast birth. That's probably gonna mean there's a little bit more pressure down through the pelvic floor. If you are in sideline, there's a lot of really amazing research that's gone on recently saying that if you push on your side, it can actually decrease the chance of tearing, especially high grade tearing, which is fantastic. So maybe you were sideline, but then your hip had to be elevated. And so maybe we have a little bit of hip pain. So there's all these considerations of the birth itself that we wanna consider even eight weeks, 12 weeks, six months down the road when you're ready to get back to activity. We also have cesarean births and I cannot stress this enough. Cesarean births have guidelines that are you're going to be given by the OBs and these are guidelines that you should always follow. We know that in the medical world, usually you'll get like the instructions and you're like, no, nah, they're being overcautious. And oftentimes they are not with cesarean births. We want to follow the rules. And the reason why is because we have stitches at different levels throughout your body. So you have stitches through your uterus. We also have some, some sort of adhesive technique on the tissues between. Then we have the scar that you can see. And if we are lifting too quickly or we're not using our force properly, then we can blow those stitches. And then if you blow the internal stitches, you have to open things up again, you have to restitch, and it is just a little bit of a nightmare. So please follow the rules, whatever the rules are, because it kind of depends on each OB. They, they're slightly different. But that means that your recovery time and your recovery techniques are going to be a little bit different than someone who had a vaginal birth. Neither is better or worse. There is definitely pros and cons to both types of birth, especially when we're returning to activity. We just need to know where you're starting with so that we can recover appropriately. Then we get into that recovery. So in recovery, some people that you talk to, their the peeing is just terrible. Heaven forbid you have to have a bowel movement after a vaginal birth. Sitting might be really uncomfortable, possibly from tailbone, possibly from stitches possibly just because you've just had a baby and just simply movement can be uncomfortable. Or you speak with people where, yeah, they were a little bit uncomfortable for a few days, but it really wasn't a big deal. Everyone is so different, but we want to take that pain and discomfort into account when you're trying to decide when is it appropriate to return. We also want to think of pressure. So when we cough, sneeze, laugh, um, transitional movement, so quickly getting up to a sit stand, Anything like that can cause pressure down through the pelvic floor, especially if we're not using our uh, pressure systems appropriately. So if that's the case, we're increasing the chance of pushing on the bladder and not having our pelvic floor kind of reacting properly. So if we're feeling an intense amount of pressure down in the pelvic floor, it's probably not the best time to start speed walking, which might increase that pressure. So again, if you're recovering from birth, a little bit of pressure in the first few days is normal, but if we're still feeling pressure later, then that can be a cue that something's up and you wanna take that into consideration. Infection is a big one because you can have incisions, either your cesarean incision, or if there was any tearing or stitches or episiotomies down in the vaginal wall or kind of vulvar area, 
those can unfortunately get infected sometimes. And sometimes it is no fault of your own. You're just unlucky, but there is a bit of an infection there. If that's the case, then it's going to likely prolong your recovery time a little bit, right? And it's just something that we have to keep in mind. Fatigue. Fatigue is a big one. If you labored and delivered, you probably just went through the craziest workout marathon of your life. And if we look at athletes who are marathon athletes, CrossFit athletes, pro athletes, generally you are not the next day going back to training. We have special ways after a really intense athletic activity to be able to recover. And that is due to fatigue and injury risk. And it's the same thing after birth. So if you look at yourself and you're like, I'm exhausted, my brain's exhausted, everything's exhausted, then maybe your body's telling you that you need a little bit more time to recover, or we just have to be really, really slow and gradual. So fatigue is a big one to look at. Muscle soreness can be from labor delivery. It can also be from holding baby. We see a lot of forward postures when we're feeding or breastfeeding or carrying or lifting. So it's something to kind of keep in mind as you return to activity. And of course, sleep changes. Your sleep is going to change when you have an infant, right? It's they're going to be up all the time. You're going to be up all the time. You're going to be crying at each other. Sleep is going to change. And so we know in the normal rehab world that sleep is the number one thing for recovery. So if you are not sleeping, then you are not able to recover. And that's fine. That's part of recovery from birth. But let's not add intense exercise onto that recovery from birth right? So we want to consider if you are sleeping wonderfully, if you feel like you're rested, then maybe it is time to add a little bit of extra activity. But if you are exhausted all the time, we know that sleep, it has a lot of impact on injury risk and that kind of thing. So we don't want to increase injuries just for the sake of getting into activity. So all things recovery wise to consider when you're trying to decide if it's time to return to activity. Then you look at your body changes. Now I already talked about the body changes in pregnancy, so we won't get into that again, but you need to know what your changes were so that you can kind of plan accordingly. Maybe you create a program around it. Maybe you're working on pelvic tilts because you know your pelvis is kind of tucked under. Maybe you're really working on breathing because that all got wonky. Maybe you have a diastasis. Um, rectus abdominis, the separation, and you want to go into a rehab program for that specifically. It's important to know what you have so that you can have a tailored program just for you when you're trying to decide what you're going to do. The other thing to consider when we're trying to return to activity is what activity looked like before. So that is during your pregnancy, but also before your pregnancy. And what's really important is that the body likes to be normal. Like it, it likes where you normally are and it wants to get back there all the time. So if you were a super intense athlete, if you were an Olympic runner, if you were an intense CrossFitter, if you did hit classes every day, then your body is going to want to get back there, which is awesome. We just have to give it some time, but it is going to come. Now you might have been very athletic prior and then your pregnancy just kicked you in the butt and simply walking to the kitchen was exercise enough that doesn't mean that you are not going to have a good recovery or a good return to activity. It just means that maybe we have to go a little bit slower and that is fine. It's just going to give you an idea of where is my body and what is a realistic plan. And that's something that you can work with trainer or physio or whoever to kind of figure out what that realistic plan would look like. But it is an important consideration. What did your body look like before the birth and not look like, feel like, have the ability to do and so that your plan can be very tailored to you. So I don't want that to scare anyone that can't, was, weren't fit or couldn't be fit or whatever prior to birth, but it is just something to consider when you're creating your plan going forward. Then you need to look at the type of exercise that you are trying to get back to. So gentle exercise, yoga, um, gentle swimming, that kind of thing, really, really nice. You can probably get into that quite quickly, likely around eight weeks or so, depending on how kind of pelvic floor is going and whatnot. If you are trying to get into weightlifting or 
sports where there's contact or movement, then there's different capacities that you're asking your body to get to. And so that is going to, again, help you figure out when it is appropriate to return. So for example, lifting weights, there was, um, I don't think it was an Olympic lifting. I think it was in the like international CrossFit competitions. I can't remember. It's a little horrifying, but about five to 10 years ago, there was this thing where a lot of the women were incontinent during their really heavy squats. And it became something like if you weren't incontinent, you weren't lifting heavy enough. But all that means is you just weren't using your pressure systems properly and you weren't using your core and you're putting too much pressure on your pelvic floor. But that is something that's very, very common when lifting very heavy weights and your breathing, your ability to breathe through things and your ability to use your core properly really, really dictate how successful you can be in that lifting weights without causing other problems. So if you are lifting weights, it's a very different athletic capacity of the body than running, which is more of a I don't want to say a small move. It's a very different movement, but it's repetitive and it's repetitive impact. So even if it's smaller steps and you're only going for five minutes, that's five minutes of the exact same movement. And that can be a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor. Same with HIIT or boot camp exercises. There's going to be a lot of pressure through the pelvic floor, but with a boot camp versus running, we might have a little bit of strength paired with a little bit of impact. Maybe we're doing jumping jacks into burpees, into squats. Your body has to be able to transition between those movements really quickly and appropriately. Sports are a whole other ball game and sports is a very big umbrella because we still have individual sports. But if we have team sports, not only is there sometimes risk of contact, um, kind of shoving, bumping, whatever, you also have team and oftentimes, if you look at even returning back to recreational sports, if you have a team that's counting on you to be there simply because they need two women on the court or something like that, then there's a greater chance that you will put those other people before determining if it's actually appropriate for you to be active. So this is why I wanted to kind of plant the seed. If you are a runner and you're training for something, but you're really not feeling good one day, hopefully, as long as you have a good coach or a good program, you can kind of switch it up. Maybe you're doing an easier 5k today. You're going to do your speed workout tomorrow or the next day based on how your body's feeling. If you play basketball on Mondays, we kind of get stuck. You have to be there on Monday or nothing. And so it's really important as you're gradually returning, even if this is the first time you play basketball and it's 10 years after baby, but it's one of the more intense activities you've done. You want to not only go slow, but also really look at yourself and be honest with yourself. Am I actually appropriate to do this activity today? It might be different every week. Or am I just going because my team needs me? And it's just something that I want people to kind of think about, especially as women, we are very guilty of putting other people before ourselves. So when we get into that, those team activities, sometimes we are no longer on the front burner. We've been delegated to the back burner in our own brain. Then other factors that we need to think of, sleep. Like I said before, your sleep is likely decreased. And if we have less sleep, we do increase risk of recover our risk of injury because we have decreased recovery. Our bodies really, really need sleep in order to actually create changes through there. And so we do tend to have higher pain sensitivity and tissue sensitivity when we have decreased sleep. So it's something to think about. Sometimes it's not in your control and that's totally fine. It just might mean that we're going a little bit slower as we adapt to activity, or we have a different system. And maybe baby tends to sleep better on certain days for whatever reason, they train after that, whatever works, but keep sleep in mind. The other thing is caregiving. And especially if you are a first time mom, you've never had to consider having baby with you or have someone take care of baby in order to exercise. So things to think about are that Sometimes you can find things that baby can come with you to. So that might be a, a baby and me or a mommy and me class. That might be uh, like a postnatal yoga where you can bring your baby. It might mean that you're walking with baby or you're running with baby a little bit later on. Usually it's only recommended to start running with baby around six months um, for their sake. But that way baby can be with you. 
you also might consider home workouts, which there are so many different videos out there or whatever you want. That way baby can be there, you can stop, you can deal with things and then go back to it. It also might mean reaching out and finding people who can take care of baby. That might be your partner, that might be parents, friends, whoever that can maybe take care of baby for you while you go and do whatever fitness activity you want to do. It also means that sometimes you have to get a little bit creative. And this is actually um, from my mom. She tells this story all the time. And when I was about six months old, I believe, my mom started going back and basically was an alternate for her old college basketball team and was basically a practice player. And she'd bring me and whoever was on the bench would hold me. And I would just get like passed along the bench. And then she'd come off and I'd be back in her arms and then I'd get passed along the bench again. And sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. But those creative juices come out a little bit in order to make sure that baby is good and healthy and happy, but mom is still able to do those activities. But it's just something that you might not have thought of before when you're exercising and you just have to be a little bit more strategic. Breastfeeding is a huge one. Not only does breastfeeding mean that hormone changes that happened in pregnancy have remained elevated for a little bit longer, which um, sometimes can increase risk of stress fractures, for example, but that just means go nice and slow. If you know you're breastfeeding, we are not jumping into activities, especially impact. It's just nice and slow. So all of your tissue, especially your bone can adapt to that new activity. But it also means that your nutrition and your hydration have different needs. So if you are breastfeeding and not doing any activity at all, you still are going to have to have increased nutrition and definitely increased hydration. Now, if you add workouts into the mix, then you have to increase those nutrition and hydration factors even higher because we don't want you to be dehydrated because you decided to go for a nice 5K run or anything like that. Again, not a problem, just something to consider when you're trying to decide what you're gonna be doing as you return to activity. The other thing is that if you're breastfeeding, it might affect timing for you. It might mean that you have to bring baby with you. It might mean um, that you have to make sure that you feed right before you go and you can only be gone for an hour and a half. Um, it might mean that you're taking your partner along on your workout so that baby can be near you so you can kind of stop and breastfeed as needed. Totally depends on what activity you're doing, but it's something that can affect your planning. And the other thing is your breasts are gonna be heavier and they're probably gonna be tender and your nipples are not gonna love chafing or anything like that. So there's a lot of really great sports bras out there that are made to support, but not compress. And those are really important. You might have extra nipple covers, you, just different techniques. And it also might mean breastfeed right before activity. So you can take some of the weight out of there. Again, it's up to you to kind of figure out what works for you, but it's something that we do wanna consider as you return. So. After all that, it's like, okay, Ellen, that's fine and dandy, but when can I start exercising? And with that comes a lot of stipulations. So what I'm looking at or what physios are looking at when we do a postnatal assessment are a few things to make sure that you are appropriate for activity. Now, for those that can go see a pelvic floor physio or can send to a pelvic floor physio, that is absolutely wonderful. These are the things that we're looking at, but if you can't, then at least you know what we're looking for and why. And then after that, I'll go through kind of a general timeline, but timelines are really rocky and we don't wanna go by specific time. I am eight weeks, I can do this. What we wanna look at are the things I'm about to talk about and can are, is your body physically ready for what you're trying to get into at this time. So the first one is going to be alignment. And I already talked about it. Our ribs and our pelvis change a lot in pregnancy to accommodate baby, which is awesome. It lets baby kind of live and have a little bit more space. But in an assessment postnatally, the very first thing that I always look at is what your alignment looks like. And are we able to come in and out of it? And so likely you're flared, likely there's some shifting and that's fine, but are you stuck there or are you able to move things around? Are you breathing with your chest primarily, which is usually the case because our breath is really important and I'll get into that in a minute, but we're looking at what kind of breath you're using right now so that you can kind of plan strategically. You're also looking at pelvis. 
And so, like I said, a lot of times in pregnancy, we end up with a slightly tucked tail or posterior pelvic tilt. And again, we want to see, are we rigid there? Did, did it, the body kind of adapt and just want to stay there? Or can we move fluidly? And then the treatment is very, very much based on whatever we find in that assessment. We're probably going to start to move the pelvis and control the pelvis, start to see if you can find a neutral pelvis. Can you stack the ribs on top of the pelvis? Or can you simply move them if you were doing some cat cows? Are you able to breathe? And then likely you're breathing in your chest and we're trying to use a passive breathing method to actually put you into alignment so that your body can understand what nice alignment is and start to use it and adapt to it. Our body doesn't like to do anything that's hard. And so when we can do things as passively as possible to show that it's easy, then it can be used really nicely. You get used to it, you can accommodate it and it's wonderful. Then as you go through things, you're gonna progress from lying down to sitting, to standing, to walking, to running, using that alignment. Then we're looking at the pelvic floor. This is, this is the one, this is the one that most people should be sent to pelvic floor physio postnatally for, and it's to figure out what the heck's going on down there. And so what we're looking for is tension, strength, endurance, and kind of how the tissue is doing. So tension's a big one, because if you are simply just given Kegel exercises, but you have a lot of tension, then you're just going to make that tension worse. And that can lead to pelvis pain. It can lead to back pain. It can lead to weird gait if you're a runner. There's so many different issues. So we're going to check that first and then treat as appropriate. We're also looking at the strength of the front, the middle, and the back of the pelvic floor. And can we use them all together equally? Usually, especially in moms, but most women, um, we use the back of the pelvic floor a lot more than the front, but the bladder sits at the front. So we need to make sure that we're using that full pelvic floor as a whole, and that's what we're going to be looking for and kind of seeing if you can control. Then after strength comes endurance, how long can you hold those strength kind of contractions for? And then we're also looking at surrounding areas. So seeing like, is there any infections that maybe you just didn't catch? Is there skin irritation down there that you didn't catch? How is the healing of any tearing going? Um, is the incision happy? Can we move the tissue? Is there weird redness? Basically, most of the time people are not checking themselves out down there. So it's a really nice opportunity to make sure everything is healing appropriately and catch something early if it isn't. Now, not all of that happens in an assessment. Sometimes, yes, but sometimes we get to tension and it's like, oh boy, things are tight. We're going to stop there. We're going to really release things. We're going to get you started on a treatment plan and then test strength later. Maybe we get to strength and strength is okay, but we want to make sure that's up to snuff before we start endurance. So these are assessment techniques, but they're not necessarily all in one session. And then based on the assessment, again, the treatment is either going to be to relax the pelvic floor or to strengthen the pelvic floor. And it has to be really, really tailored to you. And it's important that you don't just stop at kegeling on your back. You need to make sure that you're progressing through to make it look like the activities that you're trying to get back to, to make sure your pelvic floor can sustain that pressure and that load appropriately. Then we're looking at that pressure control system. So this is very much alignment. This I'm not going to get into the deep core very much because I've done a whole bunch of stuff on that previously, but basically diaphragm on top, pelvic floor on the bottom, they create a little uh, piston system to support through our abdomen and really stabilize us as a whole. And so we need to make sure that you are able to align the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, hence ribs and pelvis. We need to make sure that you're breathing appropriately um, and not just pushing pressure out the front or pressure, uh, sorry, breathing through the chest. We wanna make sure that you are not holding your breath to stabilize. So every time you go from a sitting position to a standing position, are you holding your breath? If you are, that means your body is using breath holding as your stability mechanism, and that's not optimal. That's not what we need. And so we want to look at that. Do we have a diastasis, um, which is, again, that separation? If that's the case, it's time to rehab that appropriately. Make sure that you're using your pressure control system properly and not just pooching through the front. And so we're looking at how you're using that so that we can then use the appropriate pressure control in all of your exercises. 
you're probably going to start some core stuff. You're probably going to start some breath stuff. You're probably going to practice breathing through movements based on how things are going. So on top of all of that, we also look at normal physio things. Maybe you had a really long standing hip flexor issue prior to pregnancy and it's kind of bothering you now and you want to get back into running. We can still look at those things as well to make sure that your body is ready and kind of fit as a whole. So all of those things are things that you need to consider when we're trying to return to activity. If you are getting issues or you're getting a lot of coning or we're getting a lot of pressure or you know that your pelvic floor isn't very strong or anything like that, then usually you wanna get that sorted out with gentle activity before we get into any kind of intense activity. And I promise it's worth it to just deal with it at first versus having to deal with it 30 or 40 years down the road. So after you go through whatever rehab is appropriate, your pelvic floor is fairly up to snuff, or at least enough, uh, maybe your alignment's looking really good, you're feeling really great, you're ready to get back to impact, then we do a return to impact screen. And this is, this is the screen, this is what we do, this is kind of to determine um, if you're ready for a little bit of impact. This is taken specifically from Dr. Kate, who's a great running pelvic floor physio, she's amazing, but this is actually taken directly from a few different consolidated research papers that I've also read. And so it's, there's a lot of research behind this screen and it tells us that you are ready for a little bit of impact. And I say a little bit because this means that you're ready to start going through a nice kind of slow gradual program. So you'll see if you look at it, you're, can you walk without pain? Can you balance? Can you do a single leg squat, which is what this guy's doing over here. So a lot of times we say single leg squat and people think a full pistol squat, which is where your foot is in front and you have to bring your bum all the way to the ground, which I have never been able to do. That is not what I'm gonna ask someone to do 12 weeks after they gave birth, but we do wanna make sure that we're able to control our hips and our pelvis in this position. We also have sit to stands with one leg, which is what this lovely woman is doing. We have calf raises, we have bridges. We're basically looking at, can you stabilize? Can you use the appropriate musculature? And can you do it all without symptoms of incontinence, heaviness, pain, anything like that? So if you are doing a return to impact screen with me or anyone else, it's really important that you're not only honest with whoever you're working with, but honest with yourself. Because this tells you if your body is actually ready to start a little bit of impact. And if you could do these things, but you're having some dribbling, and it feels like that's nothing, it, it's not that much, but it can be a sign that you're about to start something that your body's not ready for, which can lead to issues. And I just wouldn't want anyone to go through that. So that's kind of how physio is part of things, but it's also what you wanna be considering as we go into a return to activity. So I know everyone loves timelines. I love timelines. I hate when there's gray areas and physio is just one giant gray area. But this is a really nice example of what things might look like up to, I'm kind of beyond 12 weeks postpartum, but I can't stress enough that these are just general kind of timelines if things are going really well. I worked with someone who was incredibly fit. She was doing CrossFit all the way up to like eight and a half months pregnant. It was unbelievable. But um, her birth resulted in her OB recommending that she doesn't do anything for 12 weeks. So what I would be starting with someone else at six weeks, she was starting at 12 weeks and that's totally fine. You might not be in a good place due to all of those considerations we talked about. So you're starting this at six months or a year or whatever, but it's just kind of a general, what are we looking at when we're returning back to activity? So zero to six weeks, honestly, just be with baby and recover. That's the biggest thing. Usually, um, a lot of women will talk to me kind of prenatally about like, okay, what can I do until my six week checkup? And I'm like, here's some ideas, but like, don't push it. And usually they get to the six week checkup and they're like, I've done nothing. This is, I've, I've been, been in survival mode and that's totally fine. But if this is something, if you really feel like your body wants to move, wants to do things, walking is wonderful. 
keeping in mind that if you're getting a lot of pressure and heaviness or the incontinence or anything that we talked about, maybe we decrease how long we're walking for or decrease the speed, but walking is always really lovely. Breathing, especially if you see someone beforehand and kind of learn how to diaphragmatic breathe, that's an amazing thing to do. It also lets you be on your back again, which you couldn't do for a few months previous. Um, you can also breathe on your belly, which is very different. It's a little bit of a resisted breath. Um, reconnecting with the pelvic floor, which is very different than epic strengthening exercises. It is simply, can I squeeze down there? What does it feel like? Can I get used to that? Can I squeeze in the back? Can I squeeze in the front? Just kind of reconnecting with it is amazing because then once you do get into exercises, you're going to be flying. Um, glute bridges, which this mom is doing over here, very safe exercise because you are on your back. And so we're not putting excess ligament um, stress or excess stress on your ligaments. That, so that's a really nice exercise if you really want to start to do something and feel those muscles working. It's also really great because the glutes tend to um, disappear a little bit uh, and not really want to get involved in most activities, especially later in pregnancy. So this is a nice time to really re-engage and reconnect with those glutes. Um, alignment stuff, any kind of gentle stretching can be just fine. We just want to keep everything really easy. If you desperately, desperately feel the need to do weights, we want to keep everything really, really light. And we want to make sure that we are breathing through every single movement. We're never holding our breath and creating pressure. We're breathing through everything. Then at six weeks, um, between kind of six and eight is the best time to see pelvic floor physio. Um, if you can, because then you can start to do the assessments that we talked about and kind of see where things are at, start on your rehab program, kind of fill in the gaps. It's also sometimes the time to start scar mobilizations. It depends. Um, sometimes, especially for cesareans, they might want you to wait a little bit longer, but there's always things that you can do for the scar at this point. Um, these are just some examples of cesarean scar mobilizations, but there's also if you have any scarring that is in the perineal area or vulvar area, you also might want to be doing a little bit of mobilization there and kind of based on assessment. Um, this is the time closer to eight weeks where you can technically start low impact activity as long as you don't have any red flags. And I will restate all the red flags at the end. At gentle elliptical, not running, but elliptical um, or cycling if you are willing to sit on a bike seat and it feels comfortable. Um, you can start weights at this point or slowly increase them. But again, we want to start really gentle and be building appropriately. And only if your pelvic floor and your breath are able to support you appropriately. So no incontinence, no pressure. And this is a beautiful time to start some core activities. Now, I probably said something on the slide and totally forgot to talk about it. We expect there to be a diastasis, uh, a separation of the abs after birth, and that is totally normal. So I don't usually assess people for this, their abs separation until a little bit later, closer to 12 weeks, maybe even beyond that, because it takes time just to simply recover a little bit. So if you are a mom who's six or eight weeks postpartum and you're like, I can feel that there's a separation there, do not panic. You can start some stuff to help things come together, but generally we will see a little bit of coming together. And more importantly, with diastasis, you don't actually need the abs to come completely together to be more than functional and not have any symptoms. It's more about how you control your pressure. So again, kind of sometimes reframing our goals is really nice, but by starting appropriate core, please do not do crunches, but proper core exercises that are appropriate for this at this time, it's a really lovely way to kind of start getting things going. Then at eight to 12 weeks, this is mainly where you're just kind of increasing a little bit. Maybe you start some classes, um, gentle, not impact. You can usually start swimming at this point. Generally, you need an okay by uh, OB or midwife if you have any incisions. But if you ask them at the six week checkup, especially if they're gonna discharge you, just be like, hey, if you do wanna swim, when is it appropriate for me to start swimming? They're probably gonna tell you somewhere in the eight to 12 week uh, mark. And so you can kind of wait for that or wait till symptoms are gone or whatever they say. But swimming is a really, really great way to get back into activity that's very non-impact, no impact, which is amazing. And this is where you're really kind of 
tailoring things to you, especially because at 12 weeks, that is when if you are a runner or someone who loves impact and everything is going well and you have passed an impact screen and things are great, you can start to do some mental impact. I cannot stress this enough. If you are an athletic individual and you like running or anyone in your life is the same, please, I don't care what your fitness level was, do not start running an impact until at least three months postpartum. And the reason why is because of those ligaments that are in that pelvic floor, they got pushed on and ligaments stretch. And it is very hard for a stretched out ligament to come back to where it was. And they need time to heal. And tissue healing timelines tell us that ligaments need at least 12 weeks to heal. And that's any ligament. That's, that's ankles and knees and whatever. And so by starting running earlier, even if you ran right up to three days before your delivery, or you have been running your entire life, or you're an Olympian or anything like that, please, 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 if you have any option, do not start any kind of running activity or impact activity until 12 weeks. And then you can go from there. If you are not a runner, um, it's actually advisable to kind of wait a little bit longer. Um, basically, just if you're not desperate to start running, just to give that a little bit more time, but 12 weeks, absolute minimum then you can start to do a little bit of different activities. Um, because when we say running, what we mean is any kind of impact. So that might be a, a walk run or a jog, but it can also mean your hit classes or your boot camps, or you can start sports or whatever. So you want to be waiting at least three months for those. And then you can kind of slowly get into them and, and start your uh, appropriate return to those activities around that three month mark. Um, it's also the time, 12 weeks plus, where you're just kind of continuing. So if you are a weightlifter, maybe we're starting to add a little bit more load as long as your pelvic floor and your breath can handle it. Um, maybe you are starting to coach again. And so you're back on the ice. Maybe you coach hockey or figure skating and you're going around and maybe we have, we're going a little bit more intensely. It's all about just a slow adaptation. And especially when we get to that 12-week part mark, we can get there. Again, this is based on you starting to do stuff at six weeks. If you are not starting anything until 12 weeks, please do not go and run. We want to be starting nice and gentle and then slowly adapting and making sure we don't have any red flags, which is important. So that's, I already said that general timelines, everyone is so different. A big, 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 big thing is that it does, it takes nine months to grow a baby. And that is nine months of change in your body. And so please do not put pressure on yourself to be back in a couple months. That's silly. You don't expect to recover from a very, very long standing back injury in a couple weeks. We want to be really patient with ourselves and know that as the body adapted one way, it can adapt back. It just needs some time and some patience and some effort on your part. It also means that we want to listen to our body throughout. So if you are working out and it feels really good, but then you don't have any energy afterwards, sometimes that means you're a little depleted. So listening to your body is going to be really important, especially with incontinence and heaviness or prolapse. They are never normal. If I am talking right now to someone who is in their 50s and had a baby when they were 20 and are now getting heaviness or incontinence when they run, it is never normal. It is not normal three months after baby or 12 years after baby. And so that is a sign that something is going on that can likely be fixed. You just have to kind of sort that out because we don't wanna be increasing those issues. So making sure that we're always, always in the appropriate control over our body and our systems before using them in our activities. So please, if you know that there's any issues or you just had a baby, rehabbing right away in whatever way that means to you is super important so that you're not dealing with it 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Now, the red flags, I just, I wanted to put them all in one place so that if you ignored the rest of this presentation, you can at least see these guys. Any kind of leakage, like I just said, whether that is bowel or bladder, whether that is little dribbles or big extreme releases of bladder, 
that is never normal. And that is a sign that you are working outside of what your body's capacity allows. And so we tend to see that more when there's impact or some people might notice change of direction. Um, some people who play golf notice it when they hit the ball because of that rotation aspect. So any kind of leakage means that something's going on. Same with heaviness or pressure. If, if you are feeling an increase in heaviness and pressure with your activity, then that means again, that your body can't sustain that for whatever reason, and it's time to look into it. Low back or pelvic pain is also a big one. It usually means that there's something going on in your core or your pelvic floor or whatever, and you're not moving appropriately. So it's worth it to kind of stop and pull back and help your body adapt appropriately. Constant breath holding is the fourth one. If you notice that every single time you shift positions or you move or every time you lift weights, you are holding your breath, that means you're working outside of your capacity. That's not cool. Your pelvic floor will not appreciate that. And coning or doming. This is what I'm talking about when I say coning. And so what happens is in a diastasis, we have our six pack abs on one side and the other side. And then as we put pressure on the system, so for example, kind of straining down or holding our breath or simply just trying to move and do a sit up, all of the pressure ends up coming into that space between those abs, which is just kind of a stretchy tissue. And so if we're seeing this, that means that we're not actually using our core appropriately. And we can, number one, make that diastasis worse, but also you're likely putting a lot of pressure through your pelvic floor, which can make other issues worse, like an incontinence or a prolapse. So if moms at, again, like 12 weeks or 24 years are noticing this happening when you're doing an exercise, it means that your body does not have the capacity to do that. So this doesn't mean stop it completely. You should start by stopping, but see if you can modify. So it might mean that we just have to decrease the weight a little bit and let the body really adapt. It might mean that you have to be even more conscious of putting the pressure out to the outsides, um, which again is more in kind of the core talks that I've done. Um, it might mean decreasing speed or decreasing um, frequency or something to that effect so that you can bring yourself within the capacity that your body can maintain. Oftentimes, this just means your body needs more time to adapt. So it doesn't mean you can never do this activity. It just means let's let the body figure out how to do it properly before jumping back in. And usually if any of those things are happening, there's something going on that we probably need a little rehab program for. So if you have the ability, that's usually a really nice time to go see a pelvic floor physio. Um, seeing another physio can sometimes be helpful, but generally you're probably going to want to check out what's going on um, with someone who kind of specializes in that area. So red flags, don't ignore them. That's the, that's the big thing for this entire presentation. And so whether or not you feel ready for something, if we have red flags, we need to pay attention. Now, there's a few other tidbits that I just didn't have any other area to kind of put them in, in this presentation. But if you have the opportunity, there are so many professionals, personal trainers that have really good understanding of the postnatal body. Maybe they've done extra training in it, it would be wonderful. And that can be really helpful. And I am speaking as a physio, as a pelvic floor physio who has training in this. I need someone else to give me programs. I am a nightmare to try and make my own programs. And so when that happens, sometimes it's nice to talk to someone else who can look at your situation and create a program for you. So if you have the ability, they are out there. You just have to find them and they are so helpful. Um, also things to think about is, especially if you are usually more of a gym exerciser, but you want to start some home programs because you want to be with baby or whatever, there are so many on online programs out there. Um, obviously, if you're with a personal trainer, they can be watching you, but there's nothing wrong with looking for specific, maybe posting yoga programs or posting the light weights or something like that, that can be out there for you. You just have to start looking and look for reviews and, and kind of their expertise, but there's a lot out there and, and you can really take advantage of them and they can so help in your recovery and your return to activity. Another thing is any activity is good activity. 
And especially if you're coming from a really fit athletic background, we don't think of walking as exercise, but it is one of the best things that you can be doing. And so even if it's parking a little bit farther away from the grocery store and walking a little bit farther, or maybe you walk to a store that's close by instead of driving or whatever, any any activity is going to be really, really beneficial. And so as long as your body and we don't have any red flags is happy with it, then do it. And it's going to be helpful in the long run. The other big thing I want to talk about, because we know that just as important as our physical health is, is our mental health, that you can sometimes put those two things together. And I have heard from many, many moms that those first few months can be incredibly isolating and it's just kind of you and baby. And so sometimes you can use your activity time, your exercise time to also see people and experience maybe time with other moms or non-moms because you don't want to talk about momming um, or you're able to get out of the house. So if there are mom and baby classes, those are really nice to kind of meet and hang out with other moms and you can get or bring baby along with you. There's so many times where you can even use those fitness classes to get out of the house. So maybe that's a time when your partner hangs out with baby or your mom hangs out with baby and you're going and you just want to hit the hit class on Tuesday mornings and you can kind of see people there and talk to people. Use that time that you probably should be exercising anyways to get even more benefit out of it. Um, like I said, walking just randomly is really helpful. I know that sometimes friends are going to want to come and see baby, be like, Hey, can we go for a walk? Can we hit the park? Can we do something like that? So that you're getting a little bit of activity out of it. Or if you're going to get coffee, go somewhere where you can walk to get coffee or walk to get ice cream, just kind of adding those activities in. I'm sure your friends and family will be all for it as well. They probably need it too, but kind of pairing those things together are wonderful and there's also just really social sports out there. Golf. I hate golf. I, my poor dad has tried to make me love golf for years, but it is such a wonderful social game and you can walk. And even if you walk sometimes, or you still grab the cart, you can be talking and chatting with people. You don't even realize that you're actually doing activity. Same with if it's the summer and you go to the beach and you're kind of swimming and floating and you can just be around people and kind of be yourself and you're still getting exercise in, which is fantastic. So we want to consider that the physical side of things can also help with that mental health and you can kind of sneak those things in together, which is really lovely. Okay, very, very last thing is that a lot of what I talked about um, is a little bit more tailored to people who have had vaginal births because cesarean birth is so unique. Now, be, like I said at the beginning, there's specific rules that you have to follow with a cesarean birth. Um, a lot of them are that you can't lift more than baby or you're supposed to avoid driving um, or you shouldn't be doing certain exercises or lifting in certain ways. Um, those are all very important and we have to listen. To them. There are things that you can get started with even four weeks after cesarean, even if they're asking you not to do anything until 12, but it is just not safe to put into a presentation because everyone is so different. So if you do have a cesarean birth, if you reach out, I, I have training in post cesarean, but there are other pelvic physios that have the training as well. Um, and it's really nice to kind of reach out to them because there are things that you can start at four weeks or at six weeks or at eight weeks that can be very nice for aiding and optimizing your recovery. I just, I can't put them here because if someone was to try them and maybe do it incorrectly and all of a sudden you're blowing all your stitches, I just, I wouldn't want you to deal with that. So just know that if you do have a cesarean, it doesn't mean you have to just lie there for 12 weeks or so. You can do things. It just has to be really safe and tailored to you. So reach out if that's, if that's the case. I can always kind of help out from there. So that's all just over an hour. I much better than when I went through this the first time, but hopefully that was relatively clear. I know a lot of people in this kind of realm are, are looking just for a little bit of guidance because there isn't too much out there or there's a lot of kind of false information or conflicting information. So hopefully that just gives people something to kind of start with. And then please, please, please feel free to reach out. 
my emails on there. I don't think it's gonna be changing anytime soon. So even if you're watching this video in the future, if you have questions, I am always, always willing to answer them. So shoot me an email. It's just ellen at activesportstherapy.ca. And then this presentation will be a, joining all of the other ones that are on the screen there on our YouTube channel. So if I kind of talked about something, for example, um, we were talking about core and I didn't really get into it. That's uh, going to be in the pelvic floor and low back lecture. So there is a little bit of different information there, as well as the two prior talks that have been in this little series on pregnancy and postnatal and the pelvic floor. So hopefully if you have questions, maybe there'll be some answers in those as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything, Ellen. Um, that was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. And um, I think there's uh, a few more viewers, a few viewers left on. Uh, if there's any questions that come up, um, just go ahead and type away or speak up. I had one question uh, yeah. that might be relevant. When you speak on the, um, is it like scar mobilization? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that something that is only acute to post-pregnancy or is that something that you can, you know, as say 10 years out of having a baby, something that That's can cause them? It is optimal just after um and we do have kind of those timelines but it is absolutely something you can do at any point and that goes for cesarean scars that goes for vaginal scars but it also goes for like knee surgery and that kind of thing too so you can still make changes it's just that the the most change is generally made um in certain timelines kind of right after birth but it, you can absolutely continue to work on those scars in the future and see changes yeah Okay, great. Um, I was looking at all your uh, past lectures and what are we at? I just have to speak on this. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, and this is nine. So I'm going to end this one with a huge congrats for all your content that you've worked on in the last, um, last <laughs> few months with this one, but also prior to, was that, it was the other series in last year, -ish. Yeah, 20, I 2022. I think so. <laughs> it's all a blur. And then there were some from 2021. So yes, if, if you're interested in anything uh, pelvic floor related, you can find all of this information on uh, YouTube. Um, thanks for everyone that stayed on. And Ellen, thank you so much. As always, um, you'll be able to find all the information in an email tomorrow um, that will be coming through. And I hope everyone stays well. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. And Ellen, Congrats. Thank you finished you. another series. <laughs> you take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.